Hi everyone, it's Rax. There's a very highly anticipated game coming out on the 21st of February, Last Epoch. People absolutely love this game. It has a cult following and I have been blasting it. I've made at least 10 characters. I've tried a bunch of different masteries. I've gotten to the end game. I've tried hardcore. I tried speed running the game and uh, it just keeps me wanting more and more. And the 1.0 release with the official release of the game is going to be incredible. So I wanted to put together everything that I've learned. I have it on another uh, beautiful outline on my other monitor here. And I want to make a complete beginner's guide for you where if you know absolutely nothing about the game, including what kind of game it is, um, I can teach it all to you right now. And hopefully with this information, you will be able to blast and have a ton of fun. Let's get started. All right, as promised, we're starting from the very beginning. What is Last Epoch? What kind of game is it? What can you expect out of it? Where do you buy it? How much does it cost? Stuff like that. Last Epoch is an ARPG, an action RPG. It's like Diablo or Path of Exile, if you've ever played those games. Um, you can see some gameplay right here, running through all the different classes. You start as these base classes, and then you ascend into all of these different masteries. There's tons of different builds to play. They all feel very different, and they all have a very excellent class fantasy, at least all the ones that I've played so far. Last Epoch, the way that I would describe it to you as someone who has played a lot many of the ARPGs, is it's a midpoint between Diablo and Path of Exile. Diablo, especially Diablo 4 and Diablo 3, I guess, are usually very simple, straightforward games. You make a sorcerer, you make it a lightning sorcerer, you take the lightning stuff, there's no real crafting, the end game isn't really fleshed out. It's a very simple game currently. I'm sure Blizzard will put more into it as time goes on. Path of Exile is the opposite. The barrier to entry is very high, it's very confusing, but the end game is very expansive, has a huge crafting system. You could have a PhD in Path of Exile and still not be anywhere near knowing everything, and you can always improve in that game. Last Epoch is in the middle. It is pretty darn easy for beginners to get in there, especially after this video. Hopefully this will help you. And it does have an end game and a crafting system that's very easy to get involved with, but gets a lot more difficult as you reach the highest ends, which feels very good. But it's not going to require the time investment that Path of Exile does, and it's not going to be quite as simple as Diablo. So if it's kind of like the three little bears, too hot and too cold. If you're looking for something that was just right, Last Epoch might be perfect for you. So how do you get the game? Well, you pre-order it here on Steam. And you only have to pay 35 bucks to get the game. These other two packages are going to give you some, uh, you know, some cosmetics, which you can see up here. I'll let you read through it on your own. Um, but this is essentially going to be a, a top tier ARPG. In my opinion, this is absolutely worth $35 and adding to your Steam library and trying it. I'm willing to put my reputation on the line here. I absolutely think this is worth 35 bucks. It's kind of the same price as Path of Exile. Path of Exile is free to play, but when you get to the end game, when you have to buy some of the stash tabs, even if you buy them on sale, it ends up usually being about 35 bucks. That's what I paid initially to get like the map tab, the currency tab, a premium tab, and it's half the price of Diablo 4. And I, I would expect for most people, you will get a ton out of it. That's what Last Epoch is. That's what you can expect um, if you didn't know anything about it before. All right, let's cover one topic before we jump in, and then we'll be ready to learn everything. When I made the Path of Exile Beginner's Guide two months ago, there was something that I warned the audience about, and I said, the first time that you play Path of Exile, it is such a complicated game that I would beg you to use a guide. That way you can get through the game and learn, and then afterwards you can theorycraft whatever you want and make your own build. I would say that last epoch, a guide is not required. If you, you know, can logically pick out a build, read the spell tags for how everything scales up, and you want to theorycraft something on your first playthrough, I think you'll be just fine. When I played all the different masteries and the different skills, even when I went away from the guide and tried stuff, it seemed to always work. It seemed to be pretty balanced. So you don't need a guide to play this game. But... In case you do want to play a guide, of course, we've got you covered with the Max Roll Last Epoch section. Now, the game releases on the 21st. On the 19th, that's what we're targeting, we're going to have everything updated for the 1.0 release. So all the build guides, all the leveling guides, all the tier lists will be ready to go. 
So if you jump into the build guides section, there's leveling builds, there's end game builds, whatever you need. And every single build guide, the leveling and the end game, they all have their own specific loot filter. Yes, Last Epoch has loot filters. And this will absolutely help you. I'll show you exactly how this works a little bit later in the video, but this is going to absolutely help you so much. So that's how to get the guides and that's how to get the loot filters if you would like to use one from the beginning. Now it's time to create our character. My God, look at this character I've got at the top. Unbelievable. It's time to create our character. And here's how Last Epoch works. There are five base classes. Each class, when you level up to about level 15, it's very early in your journey, you are going to ascend and you're going to pick a mastery. When you pick that mastery, you have to stick with it. You are unable to change it in the game as far as I know. And uh, probably the reason behind that is Last Epoch wants some of your choices to matter, so it makes sense. So, for example, if we click the mage, we can ascend into the sorcerer or the spellblade or the rune master. Or if we go over here and we pick the rogue, we can be the blade dancer, the marksman, or the falconer, which is coming on launch. You can see that it's currently locked, so that's going to be very exciting. So then you might ask me, well, Rax, which one should I play? Well, it goes back to what I just said. I have played a ton of them, and all of them honestly truly feel pretty good you can really play whatever you want but then you'll say rax no 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 you need to recommend something to me okay fine i'm gonna make you some recommendations about some builds that i've played but this by no means encompasses all of the great builds out there so um the swarm blade druid is where you are scyther you're actually scyther and you run around in that form and you kill everything this is the most recent build that I played. I was actually going to play a bear druid, but then while I was leveling, I got the scyther form, and then I was running around a scyther killing everything. I was like, wait a minute, why don't I play this? And my chat said, yeah, Rax, you should be playing that. That's like the godliest thing in the game. So lightning swarm blade, if you ever wanted to be scyther chopping everything, is godly. Um, the shadow da daggers blade dancer. This might be the build that felt the most OP to me. When you get these umbral blades and they apply this uh, ailment called shadow daggers, it just destroys the entire game. I've never had an easier time just shredding everything as when I was playing this uh, shadow, dagger, shadow dagger blade dancer. So if you want to throw those little spinny things and put shadow daggers everywhere and blow up the entire screen, um, it's extremely godly. Um, the Death Seal Lich, currently on the leaderboard, some people said like it's bugged or something, but the Death Seal Lich, as you can see them attacking here, I think has eight of the top ten rankings on the current leaderboard in Last Epoch. Um, they absolutely destroy everything mercilessly with that Death Seal attack exploding everywhere. So if you want to be like a ticking time bomb, um, this is probably the second most powerful build I ever made. Echo Warpath Void Knight. This is the character that I have that's the strongest. You can see how not only does it whirlwind, but it leaves little echoes of where you were whirlwinding. So if anything's chasing you from behind, everything's going to die. So pretty much you just run in a straight line. You create mirror images of your spin to win guy, and then they run into your mirror image of your spin to win guy, and then they die. Um, this was ve very, very strong for me. Very, very fun. And it's very good if you don't need if you don't want like high APM. If you have any problems with your hands or your wrists, like I do, my my ulnar nerve doesn't work in my in my right arm. Um, this would be a very good build for you if you don't want to mash a bunch of buttons. And then of course we have to do uh, the Hydra Hedron Rune Master. This is the one where people can't believe how powerful this is. Um, when you're doing the Rune Master, you do different combinations of skills. It kind of feels like you're playing Street Fighter, but with a mage. And it unleashes all these different spells. And this Hydrahedron thing just, just essentially vaporizes everything. It's crazy. Um, if you like the mage archetype and you're looking for like a really, really involved build, um, this was the first build that I ever made. And it was my introduction to Last Epoch. And I'll admit, when I first started it, I didn't really know as much. It probably wasn't my favorite, but not necessarily because of the build. The output is crazy. 
And also, another, another honorable mention, on the launch, remember, there's two new classes, Falconer or Warlock. A lot of people are going to do that. I'm going to play Falconer because I've never played it before. Those are some recommendations for you if you're looking for them. But honestly, you don't need my recommendation. You can do whatever you want. Anything that you pick here, if you evolve or you go into your mastery with anything, it should work out for you just fine. All right. We created our character. I made a rune master called Rune Boy. Now we have some decisions to make. There are two different game modes. There's standard, which is like softcore in the other games. If you die, no big deal. Sometimes you lose uh, some loot here or there, or some rewards, but you live to fight another day and you keep going. In hardcore, uh, if you die, then you move out of hardcore mode and you can resurrect your character in softcore mode. As I understand it, what I've been told, you are going to lose your stash. So anything in your stash will be lost as you move to softcore. So that's one thing. And another thing, how we think it's going to work is if you're in a hardcore cycle, in Last Epoch, they're called cycles. In Diablo, they're called seasons. In Path of Exile, they're called League because it's crazy. It's so hard to keep it all straight. A cycle here. If you die in a hardcore cycle, you can resurrect, we think, in the softcore cycle. So you will be able to stay within the season, which is an interesting decision. Um, in Diablo, if you die, you lose your character entirely. In Path of Exile, if you die, I believe you just move to the non-league, the what's it called, the Eternal Realm, whatever it's called. Um, so hardcore, you die, you can resurrect as softcore. Then for the challenges, um, character found is like solo self found. You play by yourself, can't interact with other people. But with character found, as it says here, you have access to the items and resources for your other account found characters. I have heard there's another option that will potentially be coming back that has been used in the past where you can pick solo mode as well, but you can't share the stash with your other characters. So that will probably be the hardest version of the game. And then there's Masochist, which is grayed out, which they might bring back later, which is just a much harder version of the game, kind of like Path of Exile's Ruthless mode. So most people will just pick standard and check nothing else and go with it for the real tryhards they'll check hardcore they'll check character found or maybe even that other option if it comes back and honestly if you hate yourself enough masochist as well and that will make the game as hard as possible on you we're finally in the game we're ready to go we're ready to start our journey and i'm going to teach you a bunch of things before we even take a single step one of the most valuable things that you should know immediately is if you press G for guide, there is a guide for almost everything in the entire game. It's absolutely crazy. You don't search here, you just go up here. So for example, let's say you want to make, I don't know, a poison character, but you're not exactly sure how poison works in the game. Well, you type poison. Under ailments, you see poison here. Poison deals poison damage over time. It reduces their resistances, can stack an unlimited number of times, but only the first 30 stacks reduce. Da, 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 da. You read about it. Da, 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 da. Maybe you don't know uh, how bleed works. Bleed. Bleed deals physical damage over time. Da, 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 da. I don't need to read it to you. Hit G for game guide. This is an absolutely massive hint. Similar to items, I mean, we don't have anything good here, but if you hold Alt, over stuff that's also a very good habit to get into because then it's going to teach you how things work when you press c you can see all of your main stats and stuff and last epoch if you couldn't tell is very very good about mount about uh, tool tips and showing you exactly how everything works so nothing is a mystery in this game probably one of the most important things to learn right off the bat now before we continue let's look at the items that we're going to be picking up in last epoch stuff that we're going to be searching for so when you first start off you're going to get a bunch of crap it's going to be gray and it's going to have no affixes on it at all in last epoch well a, a base item can only have four affixes grays aren't going to have any blues not much better they can have a total of two affixes and for an item can have two prefixes and two suffixes so it's getting a little bit better so for these two, we're going to have to craft on them to make it better. I guess that's true for practically anything. Yellows are getting a bit better. You can have three or four affixes. Sometimes you have all of them filled in. Then you're going to have set items. 
set items can be useful in some situations, but this is not Diablo 3. It's not like these set items just you acquire, you know, four pieces of it, and then all of a sudden you have a 10,000% multiplier. They have their uses here and there, but that's not really what we're looking for. Then we have exalted items. They're purple. Now, the way that this works is all the affixes on gear have different ranges from one being the worst to seven being the best. An exalted item is going to have a tier six or a tier seven affix, which is going to be very helpful for us later. So you can see this suffix has 82 health on kill. If we bring it into the crafting area, you can see it's tier six. That's why it's purple. Then we go to uniques. Uniques are like in any other ARPG, they're a unique item, and sometimes they can be extremely powerful. But what makes them outrageously powerful is if you can find them with something called legendary potential. What legendary potential says is you can slam an item into the unique, and the unique is going to absorb a number of affixes equal to the legendary potential on your item. So if I took a big old purple chest armor, I was going to say sword, but you need to slam the same item type with each other. If you have a purple chest piece, an exalted chest piece with a bunch of really good stats, and you slammed it into this, it would take three of its four stats and add it to the unique. That's super endgame crafting, and then it creates something like this. I got an Apathy's Maw. For my Echo Warpath Void Knight, it's one of the godliest weapons. The best possible thing that I could get for it if I was going to slam something into it is 18 melee critical strike chance. So I farmed all day long and I looked for a weapon that finally had tier 7 melee crit chance. And this Apathy's Maw only had one legendary potential. And I hit the 1 in 4 and it was like Christmas. This is what I want you to be thinking about as you progress through the game. This is what you can look forward to. You're constantly upgrading your gear to the higher tiers. Then you get the tier six, tier seven tiers. You're looking for the uniques that you want. Then eventually you look for the uniques that you want with legendary potential. And then you go in and you slam it and try to hit the jackpot. One more thing about items that you're going to be picking up is idols. And after you complete enough of the campaign, you will have all these idle slots. They're kind of like charms in Diablo 2, if you ever played that. Except, unlike Diablo 2, Last Epoch was nice to us, and they gave us its own little dedicated slot for them. Wow, how nice. That's incredible. So we have the small idols, which can give you stuff like elemental resistances and armor. Just a nice way to cap your resistances in the game or get a little bit of health with, from idols like this. But they get much better, and they can be specifically tailored to your build or your particular class. For example, I'm playing Warpath, and this idol has 16% Warpath area. That's amazing. Warpath area, Warpath area, it just makes my main ability much stronger. So it's kind of a cool little puzzle to play where you're constantly getting these extra powers from your idol slots. And of course, as you get further into the game, you find better and better idols, you get stronger all the time. Okay, back on my beginner character, you might be wondering, wow, Rax, that was kind of a weird transition. Why did you talk about item types this early? Because now we're going to go to another beautiful topic in the beginning, the loot filter. So I'm going to show you two things about this. We hold Shift F for filter to bring up the loot filter. Let's go to create a filter and create a filter. We'll call it new loot filter. We'll, the description will be a smiley face. Um, we'll do, give it a little skull and we'll make it purple. Okay, there we go. That's our new loot filter. One thing to understand, which is listed right here for you so you can't forget it, is the, the filter follows a hierarchy. So whatever happens at the top will supersede anything at the bottom. So the thing I would like to show you first is you can make your own loot filter. You should not be afraid to make your own loot filter. It's very easy. It's very straightforward. So I'm going to add a rule. One of the first things that you should open with is something like hide. 
and let's go to, let's say, item rarity. And I don't want to see any normal, any magic, or any rare items. I don't want to see them. Add the rule. I'm never going to see them as I play. But remember, we're going to leave this rule at the bottom. We're going to add all of our rules above it. And then what's going to happen is, well, anything that we pick that we like is going to show up. And then only after it's looked at all of the rules of what we like, then it's going to hide everything else. So that's a great rule to put at the bottom. Then you can go here and you could say, um, well, I'm going to play a ranged rogue here. That's what I'm going to play. So I really care about the bows that show up. So you can use show, or if you want to get really excited every time a bow drops, you could pick recolor. I want you to make it pink. And I also want you to emphasize it. It's going to make it really, really stand out as if pink wasn't enough. But now you're going to see every time that a bow drops. How would you do that? Exactly, you know, how you would logically think to do it. Item type. And then we go, it's a two-handed weapon for a bow. Let's go under here. Okay, I don't want to check all of them. I just want the bow. Confirm. And then do I want to pick the subtypes? Well, the rogues can get all of these different bows. It shows you the eye level of them, and it shows you all of the different uh, implicits on it. Isn't, it. isn't this game great? I mean, I told you, it's so good with the um, not only the tooltips, but the loot filter functionality. You want to know what? Anytime I see a bow, I want to get excited. Just give me all of them. Add the rule. It's going to recolor the 12 types of the bow. Pink. And every time, every time I see pink on my screen, I know that I'm going to have a new bow. You can go through and add rule after rule after rule, and you can make it crazy, right? I'm going to show you something even crazier. This is about to blow your mind, so go ahead and hold on to your armrests here. So let's go back to max roll. Do you remember how I told you every single guide has a loot filter? You're not going to believe how easy it is to move the loot filter from this guide into your game. Hold on to your armrests here. We click Loot Filter, then we hit Download here. Okay, what, what just happened? This is just a bunch of garbage, right? What, what's going on here? Click anywhere in the garbage, Control-A to select it all, Control-C to copy, okay? Click Control-A, Control-C. Back in Last Epoch, Shift-F for Loot Filter, create a filter, paste your clipboard contents, Boom. I just made the entire loot filter. I think if you got good at menuing between the tab and in Last Epoch, I think you could copy a loot filter in about 1.8 seconds. And it's got everything all built for you. Another great way to think about this is if you want to get really good at making loot filters and understanding how it works, copy the Maxwell loot filter and then just go in and kind of read through how did they do this? Like, what exactly happened? And you can see at the bottom, hide, it hides all the garbage after it's already went through everything. Now, one thing that you can do with these particular loot filters is they have a strict version and a regular version. So when you get further into the game and you don't want to see as many, you can uncheck or check whichever ones that you want. That's how you can switch it to a strict version of the loot filter when you get further and you, you're rich and you don't want to see all the garbage, right? That's how easy it is. Not only is it easy for you to make your own loot filter, it's the easiest thing in the world to just copy it. Every guide has its own loot filter. I mean, it, it, it's pretty easy around here. All right, now let me show you some tricks with your inventory and with your stash management. And what I'm going to show you can only be described as otherworldly alien technology. I mean, this is like 2,000 years ahead of its time. So you're going to want to brace yourself for what I'm going to show you. So let's start with your inventory. You run through, you pick up a bunch of items, right? A lot of these things are materials that you're going to need for crafting, which we will explain later. There is a button here called Transfer Crafting Items. And right here is your collection of all the crafting materials that you've ever acquired. So when you go through and you have a full inventory, you're going to click this button and it's going to take all of the crafting materials that you had and it's going to automatically put them into your bank. 
But that's only where the craziness begins. Because over here, there is a button called Sort Items, which solves the Tetris problem for you in your inventory. So when you're out exploring and you're fighting a bunch of monsters, when it says that your inventory is full, it almost never is. Click the transfer button and the sort items button, and you see you have half of an inventory left, and you can just keep on blasting. But we have only hit the tip of the iceberg here because now we look at the stash. And I don't think you're going to be ready for this. With the stash in last epoch, you can buy 200 tabs with in game currency. You don't have to buy anything. In other words, it's free. 200 tabs. It's not quite infinite, but metaphorically, it's just about infinite. And it has this little hierarchy system where, remember uh, when I told you you're going to be looking for all these great exalted items eventually to slam into your gear? You can just save pages and pages and pages of really nice exalted affixes that maybe one day you're going to slam in. You can save all the different sets. You can have pages and pages and pages of different idols. You can, you can organize it however you want. You can even organize it by class. You can get all the different uniques in the game. You don't, you don't have to get rid of any of them. You can keep all of them. Look, I have pages and pages of empty, empty uh, ta tabs waiting for more uniques. And then, of course, you can have your own tab for the legendary potential ones. Oh, my build needs this unique with this legendary potential. I just throw them in this tab, and then I can see if I've already found one that has legendary potential one or higher. You can organize it however you want. Absolutely crazy, mind-boggling technology from last epoch trying to make our lives easier. Um, one thing that I want to talk to you about is... When you're going through the beginning of the game, though, you, what you do in other ARPGs is you acquire items, and then you go to the vendor and you sell them, right? You go here, shop. If you hold shift and right click, it automatically sells them. Okay, I'm selling everything. And that's how you normally interact with the game, and you get some more gold. In Last Epoch, that is not what you want to do once you get rolling. In the very beginning, that's fine. You're not going to have any any materials to do anything in the beginning. But what you want to do instead is you want to destroy the items and take their crafting materials so you can craft on it later. So how do you do that? Well, in the crafting system, which we're going to get to in a second, you would go here and you would use a rune of shattering. and You would shatter the item and it's going to give you some of the shards. So I just want you to keep that in mind because when you get to some of these vendors in early game, they will sell runes of shattering for 2,000 gold. That is a very, very steep price to pay when you are just starting out. You're not going to have any crafting materials, hardly, and you're also not going to have any gold. So you might be wondering, well, Rax, what exactly should I do? As you acquire the gold, buy these runes of shattering. Buy them, and then transfer them into here. Start banking them up. You don't need to shatter the items right away, but later on, you do want to shatter them. We'll cover this more in the crafting section, which is coming up right now. If there's one section to pay attention to in the entire video, it's this one. This is going to be the beginner's crafting guide. It's not going to be any endgame stuff. We'll make another video for that. But this is very important. This is the essence of Last Epoch, as you run out and you hunt very rare items and godly loot, and then you craft it to make it even better. So the first question that you might be asking is, Rax, when should I start crafting? When do I engage with it? And the answer is very, very early. You won't be able to craft immediately because you won't have any shards probably. But by the time you're 10, 15, 20, you should be able to start crafting on your gear and making it better. So let's open up the crafting window and let's learn. So we press F for forge to open up the crafting thing. You can do it anywhere. You don't need to be in town. You can be fighting, kill a boss, and stand there and start crafting. And let's throw in any item. So let's look at this interface and understand some basic things. Every item can have four affixes. Well, it can have actually more in the end game, but for now, for simple terms, every item has four affixes. Two prefixes, two suffixes, 
You can see this ring right now just has one suffix, so this ring sucks. We're going to try to make it better. And it only has 12 forging potential. Forging potential is like crafting juice. Every action that you take usually will consume forging potential, or if you're lucky, we're going to try to make it so it doesn't cost us forging potential, so we can keep crafting. Once this reaches zero, that's it. You can't craft on it anymore. So finding an item with a very high forging potential is very good. Or finding an item that already has a lot of the stuff that you want on it is very good because, because then it's easier to put on the stuff that you want. Okay, so let's just, let's just mess around with this. So if we click the plus sign over here, it's going to show us all of the different suffixes that we can add in this spot. Okay, there's a ton of them here. Um, and you can kind of use, for the most part, common sense on what's good. Whatever you think might be good usually is. Resistances, health, movement speed are usually good for practically every single class. And then when you're playing your specific build, if you mouse over whatever skill you're currently using, puncture, for example, look at the bottom of it where it says scaling tags, physical. Melee, bow attack, dexterity, that kinds of those kinds of things will make your attack better. Okay. So really here common sense usually wins. So if you go to a suffix, a great thing to add all the time is health. So as long as we have picked up some of the affix shards for health, then we can add it right here. So we add it here, and it's going to consume between 1 to 14 forging potential just for adding this on. Oof, we bricked our item. We did add some health on it, so maybe this is good for the beginning of the game. But we gobbled up all 12 of our forging potential, and that one is gonzo. No problem, let's go to the bow. You can see this one already has two suffixes, and it has one prefix. And when I look at this, applying these ailments is usually very, very good in the early game. These are beautiful, so I think that's totally fine. Bow damage looks really good too. This is just a fantastic start, and we've got 22 forging potential. So let's do the same thing. Let's go over here and let's look at some of the prefixes that we could add here. Um, we have it clicked on suffixes. That's why it's not showing us the right thing. Maybe we'll just go any affix here. Here's what's available to be applied. And we can look here, and I'm guessing maybe flat fizz would be good or bow physical damage just adds flat damage, might be really good early game. Let's pick that one. And then you can, of course, modify the crafting system. It's very easy to engage with and learn with, but it has a very high ceiling for once you get into the end game for doing the exact right combinations all the time. So one way we can modify it is by using these glyphs. And two of the ones that you will use very often are glyphs of hope and glyphs of chaos. You can read all the words. There's a lot of words there. Glyphs of hope give you a chance to not use forging potential. If you do the craft and you don't use forging potential, you can just craft on it more and make it even better. So let's throw a glyph of hope on here and boom. Oh my God, it ate almost all of my potential. So that didn't help me at all. I'm crying. Okay. Now let's pretend, I mean, this bow is pretty fantastic. We wouldn't do this, but let's pretend one of these affixes sucks. Let's say the ignite on hit. Oh, I just don't want that. So I'm going to click my Glyph of Chaos, which is going to allow me to swap it. It's going to upgrade it, and it's going to swap it to some other suffix. Okay, I don't know what I'm going to get, but I hope it's something great. And I hope to God it's going to consume 1 to 10 forging potential. I hope to God it doesn't consume 6, because otherwise we're done. Okay, it only consumed 2, and we got, oh, chance to kill. Or er, kill, chill, I mean. Okay, fantastic. Maybe that's what we wanted, or maybe it wasn't, and then we're crying. So you can see here, you're trying to craft the correct affixes, obviously, and then you want to craft them, you can move them all the way up to level 5. There are other things that can happen. For example, a craft can crit, which is fantastic because it adds um, another tier to one of the affixes that you're working on. Actually, in some rare cases, critting on something can actually make it worse, but that's uh, kind of a unique situation. Down here, we also have runes. I'm going to explain some of them to you that you will use commonly. Rune of Shattering, 
this is how you're going to destroy your items to get more of your affix shards back so you can continue crafting. It's going to pick all of the affixes and it's going to destroy them all and it's going to roll between zero and the affix tier and give you that many shards of that particular thing. So I'm either going to get zero or one bow damage, zero or one bow physical damage, zero or one bleed on hit, zero to two chance to chill. Let's just do it. Boom. And those are the three that I got out of that. Fantastic. So when you get a lot of runes of shatter, we're going to be buying them from the vendors for 2,000 gold. When you get the higher tier items to drop, runes of shattering are a great way to start building up your bank of materials so you can craft. Another very common one is rune of removal. Shattering does all of the affixes and gives you some of the affix shards from all four or however many you have. Removal picks one randomly and it gives you all of those back so for example uh let's just see what happens here so remember the 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 tiers are two two one two so we hit it on the bow damage and it gave us all of the shards if we do it again we hit it on the crit it gave us all of the shards so removal is very very good for either shards that you really need for your build or shards that you're very low on. Which brings me to a very important point about the game and about crafting. So let's say you're playing this bow rogue and you say, okay, well, I know which ones I want. I want like bow and I want mail or I want a physical damage. I want attack speed and I want crit. But something like a shard like throwing damage or fire damage, I don't do any of that. So I don't really care about those shards, right? Wrong. Not necessarily. Because remember, in order to use a Glyph of Chaos, whenever you find an item that's really, really good but has one affix that you don't want, in order to use this Glyph of Chaos to change it, you need a shard to upgrade it. So even though I don't care about health on kill normally, if I don't have health on kill shards, then one day I might not be able to craft, craft it off for something that I want, right? So don't sleep on shattering a bunch of different things if you're low on the shards because you want to build up your shards so you can craft all the time, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. So if we look down here again, another one that's very common, or I wouldn't say common, but is very good for the early game is Rune of Discovery. You know, discovery is real simple. It takes an item and it just fills in all of the different slots with something. This is a gray item. Boom. Now we got melee fire, melee damage leads us health, minion spell damage, chance to blind. So if we were a big axe boy, all of these look pretty good, but minion spell damage, that probably certainly doesn't do anything for me. So we would chaos this off. And now we have all attributes. Look at this. Look at this axe now. Melee fire damage, we leech it as hell, two attributes, chance to blind. There you go. Okay. You can see once you engage with it a little bit, it's pretty easy to use. You can make your items better, and they do make them a lot better in the early game. And then when you're done with it, you're done using it. Okay. You can just use Rune of Shattering, bam, and get a bunch of the shards back for your next craft. And then another one down here is the Rune of Ascendance. So the Rune of Ascendance is going to make whatever item type it is, it's a body armor, it's going to make it a unique body armor. Now, this is the information that I have as of right now in Last Epoch. Anyone in the comments can correct me if I'm wrong. But as I understand it, the Rune of Ascendance is not dependent on anything other than the type that you use it on. So for example, I have this shitty gray low eye level requires level four body armor i'm if i use a rune of ascendance i'm going to get a unique body armor it's not going to be a unique sword it's not going to be a unique bow but nothing on it matters you can get the best body armor in the game right now you don't have to go farm like an eye level 86 body armor and then use it to get something better as i understand it it does not matter at all so let's just use it and see what happens. Okay, we got Urine's Wisdom. There we go. I mean, it's got 75 health on it, so when we hit level 27, that might be pretty good for us because health is really godly. 
let me know in the comments if that's wrong. If it's wrong, I'll pin it to the top. But as far as I understand, as soon as you get the runes of ascendance, for whatever unique that you might need in your max roll guide, you might want to start slamming them in the right base type to try to get your legendary items. Anyway, this was a very quick intro to crafting. Press F, throw something in there. Use Glyphs of Hope to try to not consume your forging potential. Use Glyphs of Chaos to remove the affixes you don't want. If you just want to add something to it, just click the plus sign. You can search for stuff here, health, for example, uh, health on kill or whatever, and then you can search damage, um, and then you can you know, pick whatever you want. And that way you can modify your items very early. You should be doing it right in the beginning of the game, like when you're 10 or 15, once you have some shards. Shattering picks all four, gives you some of the affixes from it. Removal picks one random one, gives you all of the shards from it. Very good if you're low or if you really need some of them. Rune and Discovery is great on gray items early game. Make them into yellow. It's got all the affixes there. And Rune of Ascendance is going to upgrade something to unique. Check your max roll guide. Now let's cover how the skills and passives work in Last Epoch. If we press S, we can pull up the skill tree or the different skills. And these are all unlocked just by playing your character. You just get to a higher level, you unlock all of these. This is unlocked when you put points into your main rogue passive tree. Then you are going to get a mastery. You are going to select either Blade Dancer or Marksman or Falconer when the game releases. And for me, I have chosen Marksman. So that's how you're going to unlock all of the different skills available to you. And when you have unlocked them, you're just free to put any of them on your bar. But that's not what makes Last Epoch interesting. The cool part is up here, every single one of these skills has an entire skill tree associated with it. So you can pick five of the skills based upon the rogue skills and these skills here and however many skills you get from the different masteries that you select. You get one mastery, but you can also get some of the other ones by putting in uh, passive points, which I'll explain in a moment. And then you put them up here and you can make them extremely powerful. So for now, I'm playing Puncture, but maybe later on I want to play something different. I'm going to play a uh, Hall of Arrows. That's no problem. So as I level up, I put in the points. But notice, I only have two slots. I'll get another one at 20, another at 35, another at 50. And let's say, um, oh, I really want to spec detonating arrow right now. I want that to be my main attack. Well, if you go in here, you can respec, and you've got two choices. You can either say, whoopsie, I put one of the points incorrectly. So I just want to remove this one. Yeah, I want to respec one of those. And I want to respec another one. And then I'm going to stop respecing. Uh, I was going to say, notice how it didn't give me the points back immediately because I already had two points to spend. So let me, sh let me demonstrate that one more time. So now I have no points to spend. Let's respec. Let's remove this. And uh, let's remove this. Notice how it didn't give me the points back if you didn't see that earlier. You got to play a little bit to get them back. They're not going to let you just willy nilly move stuff that easily. You got to play a little bit. It's not long, but just be aware if you want to step backwards, you're going to have to play for a little bit to earn that point back. Um, but let's say, again, I don't even want to play Puncture now. I want to play Detonating Arrow. The way that I get rid of this is I respec and I de specialize the skill. That's what moves it. Then I can drag detonating arrow up here, and now I have the detonating arrow tree, and then I can start moving through it and specking into that. So that's how the skills work with the different skill trees. You can have five skill trees up here, but you can use any of the skills down here whenever you want. Press P for passives. When you're in the rogue tree, this is what you will have in the beginning. You'll start to fill out however you want to move forward. Then when you pick your mastery, you'll notice you have access to go all the way down, all the way through the tree when you're specking into it, because I picked Marksman as my mastery. The other ones are only going to let you go halfway. There's a big old chain right here. So you can put points into Blade Dancer and Falconer once the game releases. If they have some juicy talents that you want for your Marksman, no problem. But the mastery is going to allow you to go all the way to the end. 
And if you want to respec, let's say we want to respec some points, you just go to a town and you go to the little brain vendor and I'd like to respec some of my mastery points. Uh, so I don't want this. It's going to respec for gold, respec for gold. Okay. And then you get the points back immediately and you can go right back in and place them wherever you would like. All right. That's pretty much it. Pretty easy to understand. The skill tree, you get all of them, put them into the pass or put them into the tree up here, despecialize them as you level up if you want to use something different. Put the points into your different passives. The mastery lets you go all the way, and the other ascendancies, you can only go halfway. Here's a very easy topic to cover gambling. So there are little gambling vendors. They got little dice above them where you can go here and you can spend gold and you can try to get something very, very good for your build. At least as I understand it in the current version of Last Epoch, gambling is usually not worth your time. If you have a very bad bow and you see a bow base here that's really, really good and maybe it's much better than yours, then you could consider spending the gold and gambling for it. It's going to roll the rarity. I got a magic bow. Okay. It's got some extra damage on it that probably was a decent result. But in general, instead of gambling, you could just buy Runes of Shattering. And in the end game, there are gold sinks which can give you a massive amount of items. And usually, from everything that I've seen, gambling is just not a very good option. So you should not be using gambling as your main source of items. You should not be using gambling as your gold sink. There are other things to spend it on. Now, one thing is I believe there's going to be another kind of gambling that has to do with the factions that are going to be released in 1.0. I don't know if those are worth it, so that might be worth it, but the standard gambler with the dice currently in the game, no. Let me give you some hints on the campaign that will help you. First thing that I would say is exactly the same feedback I gave on my POE beginner guide a few months ago. There are a lot of ways to optimize the campaign, skipping these quests, that quest, this tricky thing to skip part of the campaign. I wouldn't do any of that in the beginning. Just play through the campaign and enjoy it and do all the quests and just have fun. Don't let anybody tell you how to get through it. But I will offer some hints um, and that I encountered when I went through it and I wish I would have known. So... In Last Epoch, you're going to go through the different eras. Okay, it's called Last Epoch. It makes sense. But I found a lot of the times I was genuinely confused about what I really needed to do or where I needed to go. If you press M to open up the map, you can click on the era with the question marks. The yellow question mark is a main quest and the white and teal question mark is a side quest. So I click here. Ah, okay. Then I can easily see I've got a main quest and a side quest here at this town. I got a side quest over here. I got a side quest over here. It makes it easy to teleport around. When you're teleporting, left click on the waypoint and do not click travel. Instead, right click. Left click, right click. That's the fastest way that I know how to travel. You can let me know if there's a faster way um, in the comments. But one additional trick here. I'm going to need to hide my webcam for this. In the bottom left corner, there are your passive point rewards. I'm at 5 out of 15, and my idle slot rewards 1 out of 8. These need to be completed by the time that you finish the campaign. You get them from side quests. So if you get to the end and you have a bunch of side quests that you didn't do, you might be wondering, well, how can you tell which of the side quests remaining would actually give you these rewards? It's over here. If you click on Evacuation, then you go over here, you can see that it gives you one passive point. So I need to do evacuation. Armory aid gives me experience and gold. We don't need that. And ancient path gives me experience and gold. We don't need that. So it's a very easy way for you to tell if you get to the end and you don't have all of these rewards, how to go in and get the rest of them. But just go in and have fun with the campaign and uh, enjoy your first playthrough. Let's talk about one of the most exciting things about Last Epoch that's coming on the launch, the different trade and item factions. So what exactly is going on here? Last Epoch is going to allow you to spec either into trading, which is going to be the merchant guild. You can trade items with other players. And there's going to be a bazaar, which is going to help you give you an interface like an auction house to trade those items. 
or Circle of Fortune. You play it by yourself and you get prophecies and you just get way better items. It's a way for you to choose how you want to play the game. Do you want to be a big trader and participate in the economy? Or do you just want to blast solo and get the best items possible? One thing that I should mention about this is if you're having any thoughts of, well, I'll just start trade, I'll trade for the uniques that I want, and then I'll just respec to solo and go that way. Um, while I appreciate that kind of like optimized thinking, that won't work. You can respec, you can change your mind whenever you want, but that's not to your advantage. Because when you engage with the items, for example, if you reach like rank six of trading and you trade, for like a rank like a rank six item you have to be at least rank six within trading to continue using that item so if you say oh i traded for the bow that i really like and now i'm just going to respect to the solo thing while i grind with that bow uh, that's not going to work because you're not going to be able to equip the bow you can respect if you want but you lose that item hopefully that makes sense so they have some safety measures here to just prevent people from switching willy-nilly in general, you should have an idea of what you want to play and stick with it. It'll be better for you. You can join it toward the end of the campaign. I believe this is in Act 9, which is like the literally the end of the campaign. That's when you're going to be able to join a faction. And then there's different ranks and reputation. You can go all the way to rank 10 with either the trading or with the solo. And uh, there are some pretty, some pretty significant rewards. So if we go down here... Um, all the way at rank 10, you could trade all legendary items. A legendary item is when you have a unique and then you slam an exalted item into it, right? I believe that's what a legendary item is. So eventually you can trade like practically everything if you reach rank 10. And then when you go into the Circle of Fortune, which is solo, you get some pretty incredible things. Um, you get 35% chance to drop twice as many items just right off the bat. Um, your prophecies, which is each of the factions have specific events that you engage with. That's one of the events that you engage with as a solo player. Um, they're going to be duplicated. When a set item would drop, instead it gives you the entire set. That's crazy. That would be insane in some other games. Um, items that would drop as rare above level 44 have 25% to become exalted. That's the tier 6 and tier 7 affixes. So you can read through it and you can see that it's pretty crazy. But this is said certainly something you want to engage with. So be thinking about, do you want to join the merchant guild and trade everything and trade for the stuff you need and sell the stuff that you don't? Or do you want to be a solo blaster and try to find the godly items that way? It's totally up to you. But don't respect willy-nilly. That won't be advantageous for you. All right, we've got basic understanding of most of the ideas in the game, and we have our campaign tips and tricks. What are we going to be doing in the end game? There are three main things you can do. Dungeons, arena, and the main one is the monolith. And they're working on more end game content. I think Uber bosses are next and more updates to the monolith in case you cared. So let's start with the dungeons. There are three dungeons that you can do, and each of them requires you to do a specific mechanic, which is going to give you an extra key on your keyboard. It's D by default if you want to respect it. There's something else you can in uh, by changing the inputs, but by default, the special mechanic is D. So make sure you go in there and you read what the mechanic is and use it appropriately as you're going through the dungeon. So the first dungeon is Lightless Arbor. This is the gold sink. This is where you're going to spend all your gold for massive rewards at the end. Soulfire Bastion, you go through it. I believe at the end it's got a gambler, and the gambler can give you special items with really good affixes. And finally, Temporal Sanctum is how you're going to create your legendary items. Remember, you get a unique with legendary potential, and then you get your exalted item. You run the dungeon, and then you slam it together to try to create uh, the god items here. Each of the dungeons has, have different difficulties. The higher difficulties, the higher the rewards. You understand that? It's pretty easy. How do you access a dungeon? You right-click the key, and that's going to show you where it is on the map port there and then you'll see a, a spot to punch in the key and then you can run it next we have the arena same thing right click it. it's going to show you where to go the arena is really easy to understand it's just an endless wave of monsters and then the arena key of memory is what you're going to go for when you're going to be competitive and try to get the really really good rankings
which is why it's very lucky that last epoch has borrowed this crazy technology from some foreign being 3,000 years ahead of its time. Last epoch actually comes on launch with a leaderboard. You can see liches are pretty good. Lich, 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 lich. Remember that death seal lich that I showed you and uh, some of the other specs for lich? Uh, these guys are just out of control. Here in first place, we have a spell blade and then we have a lich over here and we have a rune master. So two rune masters in the top 10 as well. Um, we'll see how the 1.0 shakes it all up though, but there is a leaderboard if you just press L. So if you want to show them what you're made of, there is a leaderboard there to be competitive with. And then finally, you have the monoliths. And the monoliths are where you're going to be spending the majority of your time. And so I cannot explain it any better than the beautiful beginner guide written here by McFluff. And by the way, there are guides on practically all of the stuff on Maxwell if you would like to um, read further. So anyway, there are echoes within the different timelines. And all of the echoes are kind of like your maps in PoE, or they're kind of like your nightmare dungeons in Diablo 4. Um, but they are connected. They give you a certain amount of rewards for it. And there are certain penalties that last for a specific duration. So, for example, if you ran this echo or this map, whatever you want to call it, it's going to give the enemies 155% increased elemental damage, and it's going to la last for the next five maps that you run. So that's pretty terrifying. So you need to consider the rewards, and you need to also consider what you're up against and how long it's going to last for. You don't want to be dragging those um, terrible mods into like a boss fight, for example. So when you're moving through the specific web or the specific timeline, Whenever you're going to complete an echo, you're going to build stability. Stability is going to fill up this quest bar, and you need to do these specific quests, and then the final one is going to be a boss fight. You beat the boss fight, you win, and it's going to grant you a blessing. A blessing is a permanent bonus. It could give you things like elemental resistances or chances to get um, specific idols and stuff like that. So we're building stability in the specific timelines by running echoes, then we do the quests, and then we fight the boss at the end to complete that timeline. Once we get far enough into it, once we complete, I believe, the final three normal timelines, you will unlock the empowered timeline. So if we go down here, we get the empowered one. We complete the top three. Fire, Winter, and the Last Ruin, get the Empowered Ones. The Empowered Ones are much more difficult, and the Empowered Ones let you build much higher Corruption. Corruption is just going to make the timeline harder for more rewards and more XP. So, how do you build Corruption? When you get to the Empowered Monolith, I wouldn't recommend adding Corruption to the regular Monoliths. You want to run through the regular monoliths as fast as possible, get to the end, and then you want to run the empowered monoliths and build the corruption there for more XP and more rewards. And you're going to be looking for the Shade of Orobus. When you find him and when you fight him, the further away you are, it's going to raise the corruption level of that particular timeline. Then you can run it again, it's going to reset the whole web. Then you can go again and um, get more XP and loot. There is also target farming. Each of the specific monoliths have certain unique drops to them and certain ways to target farm gear. That's all explained in all of these guides. So when you get further into the game, you're going to want to read through them and see where exactly does everything drop? Where do these blessings drop? Where does this unique drop? Which one do I want to be building the corruption in? in order to get the very valuable items for your build. I don't want to make this too complicated. I don't want to make it sound like too crazy hard, because it really isn't. So you just start here, you run through the different webs, la 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 la. You do the quest, you fight the boss, you beat this one. Hooray, you go over here, you beat that one. You go through all of them. You finally beat the last three ones, and then it unlocks the empowered monoliths. Then you'll check, okay, 
What uniques am I looking for? Oh, okay. Uh, the Reign of Dragons. That drops the unique that I want. So then you will run that over and over and over. You'll fly the, the Shade of Oropus. You'll kill him. It'll raise the corruption. You get better rewards. You go again. You get the greater blessings. There's a higher level of blessing in the Empowered Monoliths, which is going to give you an additional power. And you're just going to keep going and try to juice up your character as much as you possibly can. And then you're going to go into the Endless Arena and you're going to try to get rank one on the leaderboards. There's one cool thing I want to show you before I wrap this up. One of my sponsors, Crimson Market, has built a last epoch hologram PC and they're giving it away. They give away godly prizes every month. They're normally a Diablo 4 trading site, but they're expanding into other games and they have this loyalty um, rewards program on their site. They're giving away this last epoch hologram PC. So just to show you a little bit about that, the way that you do it is you sign up and you choose a tier to, sus to subscribe to them. You earn points that way. Another way that you can earn points is if you trade, if you still play Diablo 4, I think they have Dark and Darker now and they're expanding into other games. Obviously, they love Last Epoch as well. And then finally, they do a drawing. And there have been people that have won these massive rewards with just a single loyalty point. So little plug for my sponsor, Crimson Market. I love these guys. You should go here and you should sign up and you should win that hologram Last Epoch PC. All right, we finally did it. I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, I had a blast making this video. It was a lot of work, but I really enjoyed it. I hope this is what you guys were looking for. I hope you guys got something out of this and feel like you're excited for the launch coming uh, in a few days. I'm going to be blasting. I'm going to play hardcore SSF. going to make it as hard on myself as possible. Let's see how far we can get and how well we can do. And uh, it's going to be a good time. Thank you guys for everything. And I want to know who wins that uh, hologram PC, by the way. That's pretty sick. Anyway. Uh, I'll see you guys in game. Many more Last Epoch guides are coming. Thank you.